Welcome into K-State Online. I am Mason Voth. That is Drew Galloway here on a Wednesday where we sit, uh, be what, doing math in my head. We're like, tw- uh, we're like 35 hours away from K-State LSU tipping off in Bramlage Coliseum. And for the Cats, this is their lone significant home non-conference game of the season because everything else is just kind of disgusting, not really appealing uh, based on what you have. Your your other two notable non-con games are going to take place on the road at St. John's and at Wichita State, which we point out here on a couple of those, St. John's is into the top 25 now at number 22. They've started their season with blowout wins over Fordham and Quinnipiac, and Fordham actually has a win over Seton Hall after their loss to St. John's, so don't count the Rams out. And then Wichita State, got to give the Shockers credit as much as that pains me to do, but they are looking like a much more impressive team to start this season. Um, We'll see what they have in store because they've got a massive home non-con game tomorrow night. For the first time since leaving the Missouri Valley, they are hosting Northern Iowa. So a big rivalry game going on there for them. But they've started their season 2-0 and with oh, a seven-point road win at Western Kentucky, which is you know a pretty decent um, non-Power 5 challenge. And then they had a 20-point home win over Montana State, who has won the big sky in back-to-back years to take their NCAA tournament bid, as K-State knows all about Montana State getting to see them in the NCAA tournament two seasons ago. But it is LSU on tap for the Wildcats tomorrow night. Drew, uh, what is your number one expectation for this game from K-State? I mean, I think that the expectation is that K-State has to play a little bit harder than I think that they did for a lot of the game on Saturday after they got up big. And you want them to play harder than they did in the first 10 minutes against New Orleans. Like, this is the first team that K-State has played that is capable of beating them. And, and, and I don't know if LSU is or are world beaters. And like, we'll, we'll get more into LSU. But th- this is a game where if K-State shows up and doesn't really act like they want to be there for the first 10 minutes or gets up big and kind of just stops caring, LSU is capable of beating them. So I, I think that the first thing would be to play harder uh, but the, the second expectation, and, and this is a fun expectation now because last year is like, oh, well, I hope K State can make shots. Uh, you would expect K State to be able to make shots tomorrow night, uh, just with how the season has gone so far. And, and even though the shooting wasn't great against Fort Hayes State, you could still see that there were some flashes of it. And, and we've gotten to see it uh, more consistently in the first two regular season games so far. Well, you're right. K-State does need to come out and just kind of locked in, shooting it on offense and and really just kind of bringing it because I think one guy that we know, whether it ends up working out for him or not, that will bring it tomorrow night is Cam Carter, who will probably be pretty fired up to to play against K-State, be back in Bramlage. And um, I I don't know that there's necessarily bad blood between Cam Carter and K-State. I think that Cam Carter improved his situation, K-State improved theirs. But I, if I was Cam Carter, there'd be a little bit of me that would say, okay, essentially the reason why I ended up at LSU is because K-State has decided, and it was apparent, that they can't be as good as they need to be if I'm one of their three best players, which is what he was last season. He was one of the three best players, and it ended in a first-round NIT loss. So – I think he comes in with that, and you're going to get chucking from Cam Carter. I don't know if it's going to be making or if it's going to be what. The turnovers will be a big thing. K-State has forced 32 turnovers in their first two games of the season. Um, Now, they had one high turnover game against um, over the the weekend, I guess, against Cleveland State, which K-State also turned it over a lot in that game. And then New Orleans only turned it over 12 times when K-State only turned it over nine in the season opener. But I think K-State might be able to get that to happen. That's going to be something that they'll have to do. And then really, Cam Carter is about the only real threat for LSU going into this game. I know Fan touched on it a little bit with us um, when we did the Sunday show, but he also pointed out yesterday, he said, kind of talking about LSU's portal class, 
um, that with Evan Mekawa's, uh transfer portal rankings, he had their transfer class at number 70 in college basketball. That's not very good when you consider what there's – that's right around – there's not even that many Power 5 teams, right? Or getting close to, I guess, with the Big East, there's a lot of teams. Um, but Cam was the number 139-ranked player in the class. Every other guy they brought in through the portal were ranked outside of the top 300. So it's not like they brought in a bunch of studs. This is one of those games where – they have guys that can beat you. It's a power conference opponent. I think Matt McMahon is a good coach, but as long as you step up and really make sure that Cam Carter has a bad night, um, you're going to probably come out on the other side with a win. What do you think we see in the K-State versus Cam Carter matchup tomorrow? Yeah, I think that Cam Carter is probably where where you start because he's been having a really good start to the season. He's actually been lighting it up from three to start. He's eight of 13 uh, and it was four of five in their game against Alabama state. Uh, but the, the turnovers are still there. He has seven turnovers in the first two games. Uh, so I think that K state, if they can really kind of get into cam Carter and get him to turn it over a, a, a few times tomorrow night, that K state should be able to come out on top uh, because K state will be able to get out and run on those turnovers. Uh, I think that Jalen Reed is another one that is a capable player for LSU has had kind of a, an up and down start. You see that he's averaging 15 points per game, but 24 came against Louisiana Monroe, and then he only scored six against Alabama State. So I, I think that he's probably somewhere in the middle uh, because if you really look, he has only missed two shots on the season, but he only took three shots against Alabama State. So was that him just not being very aggressive that night, or it, was there just something kind of off? Because really, if you look at LSU – and I'm sure that LSU people will say this about K-State. It is so hard to determine if a team is what we would say good through two games. Because the, their first game, they beat the absolute crap out of Louisiana Monroe, who is pretty awful. And they won that game by, I believe it was like 35 points. Uh, then they turn around, and this is where I say, like, K-State had a sleepy game, and they were up 20 points with two minutes to go on Saturday. LSU played Alabama State on Sunday. They had a sleepy game and were losing at halftime and, and had to come back and outscored Alabama State by 19 points in the second half to win by 13. So uh, the sleepy game, I'd rather have K-State's where the, the result was the same, a 13-point win, but K-State was in control the whole way. LSU probably had to expend a lot more energy to beat Alabama State than K-State did to beat Cleveland State. Uh, but you also look into that Alabama State game, and this is where LSU, again, team to really kind of figure out what they are because they play so many guys. They had 10 guys play 10 or more minutes against Alabama State, and I think that was just them trying to find some energy, try to find something that kind of goes their way uh, to get them over the edge. Uh, but it, it's just interesting when you see that because you don't expect a team like LSU to struggle with Alabama State, who is one of the worst teams in the SWAC. Uh, but uh, another guy that I think can be capable of beating K-State, too, is Jordan Sears. Uh, he's a transfer from UT Martin. I believe this is his second year at LSU. And, and he's he's a pretty good scorer, but just not consistent and not consistent from three to start this season. So... Uh, well, and, and not consistent for his career. This is the no. thing to me that's tough about LSU is none of their guys have a track record to where you can say, okay, what what is this guy going to do to us? Because So if you go and look, Curtis Givens is uh, second in terms of three-point shooting right now but behind Cam Carter. Um, again, two games, small sample size. He is a true freshman. He is, He's never played college basketball before, so we don't know what that looks like. And then Jordan Sears, like you're talking about, wild variation in his career on his averages and in his shooting ability. So he spent his first two years at Gardner Webb, his his next two years at UT Martin, and now he's at LSU. Year one at Gardner Webb on almost th on over three and a half attempts per game from three, he shot uh 39%, close to 40%. The following year on three attempts per game from three, he shot 21%. Then his first year at UT Martin again, a little over three attempts a game, 31%. 
Last year, he's attempting five and a half a game. He shoots 43%. And now this year through two games, he's shot eight and he's shooting 25%. So it, you can't get a feel for what Jordan Sears will look like there. And then Mike Williams is another guy. Um, he hasn't shot it well to start the season, but last year you could make the argument that he was probably LSU's best shooter, was 37% from three on three attempts a game, was 39% from the, the floor as a guard. Um, so it's just there's a lot of variety here with LSU, and, and you're going to have a tough time, I think, going into it if you're K-State with kind of that knowledge of, oh, we can leave that guy, let him do this, let him do that, or, hey, we have to worry. I think you're going to have to just feel this game out, and it's going to be a how are guys doing tonight. You at least know the tendencies – of what they're going to try to do, but LSU is full of a lot of guys that you aren't going to know what a consistent outcome will be. Like K State in past years, you can name whatever team you want to throw out there. But if K State was playing against KU, you know what Hunter Dickinson is going to do in the game, and you're pretty confident that you know what the outcome is going to be when he does those things. Same thing for Jalen Wilson or whoever you want to throw out there. Uh, Dewan Harris would be one of those, where you know his tendency is not to shoot the basketball. So you're like, yeah, he might take a couple and they might go in, but we're not worried about that. You don't have that luxury with LSU of knowing what the outcome will be if certain guys do certain things. So that's a little bit of a wild card thing, but I think it also that you'd rather face a team like this because it signals to me that they're not very good. Yeah, I think that because of that variety – it makes the game just wildly fascinating to me. And you can kind of see that you don't really see this very often that uh, Bart Torvik and uh, the Ken Pomeroy predictions are so far apart. Like Bart Torvik almost has this as a case state to win this game by eight. And then on the, the Ken Palm projections, it's case state by three. And you just don't see that very often. But I think that some of that stems from Bart Torvik probably being higher on K State. Yes, being higher on K State than uh, the Ken Palm rankings are so far. But it, it just makes this game very fascinating, and I'm very intrigued because as we're recording this, there isn't a spread for the game yet, and I think that that will kind of give a better gauge, uh, not to uh, be the one that is really kind of trying to cover bases here. But my guess is that the spread ends up somewhere between that three and the almost eight. Yeah, I, I would, I want to say like five and a half, but I, I bet it's probably closer to like four. Um, and I would say if that's the case, then I would take K State because I feel pretty good about where they are in this game. I think this is to what you're talking about. Everything that makes this game so fascinating. I think this kind of is a a good early season maturity game for K State where. You want some of your guys that have been around a little bit longer to lead, come out, put on a good showing early on in the game. Like Coleman Hawkins, come out, be good, be clean, don't turn the ball over, don't be as loose as you were against Cleveland State. You would probably like a guy like Doug McDaniel to maybe have his first real good offensive game if he can do something for you there. Uh, and then I, I think Max Jones is maybe the most important guy because we saw how good he could be in the opener this season against New Orleans. He did some good things uh, in the game against Cleveland State, and I think of him as a guy that he might be the most level-headed dude on this team for K-State. Um, he obviously has skill, but I think that he is in a position where that might be the leader for K-State this season. Look, he's not played at the Power 5 level before, but that is just a guy that really seems to grasp and understand how you have to win games and, and how you have to to take care of your own business. And that's what this is for K-State. So I think those three guys stand out to me um, as being, at least on the emotional side, they have to be in check and they have to come out, get things going early and be good. Anything else you get outside of that, I mean, David Gasson would play a role in that too. Uh, I think three years into the program now, he's probably in a position to be a pretty good leader. Now, defensively, what do you think we see from K-State? What what should their approach be uh, in this game and who kind of leads the charge there? Uh, defensively, I'd like to see just more connectivity. I think that they were they took a step in the right direction against Cleveland State in, in that first half. 
uh, but you would like to see them more connected. And I think that that will probably improve as the season goes on. Like I have no concerns about K-State's defense going forward because last year there were a lot more limitations that K-State had and they still ended up being a really good offense. Uh, the, the thing that has to improve and especially in a game like this where the other team, I, I don't think that LSU on a, on their best night is better than K-State on their best night, but they can be if they keep getting second chances and the defensive rebounding against Cleveland state was pretty horrible for probably about 30 minutes of the game. There was a good stretch in that the early part of the second half and then case it kind of let their foot off the gas again. Uh, but you, you'd like to see that that improves because that, that was really good against New Orleans, who is another team that kind of like Cleveland State, if they were going to score, was going to come on the offensive rebounds. Uh, but case State just didn't do that against Cleveland State. That has to get better in this game because if there is a formula where case State would lose, it, it's probably – getting crushed on the defensive glass and allowing a lot of offensive rebounding and then being careless with the ball. And, and, and that's mm-hmm. really been the formula for how K state has lost in the drone tang era as if they're not doing <laughs> either of those two things. Yeah. Uh, right now through two games, K state is 264th in turnover percentage on offense. Um, also shooting free throws outside of the top 300. They're, they're at 60 and a half percent. Another thing that I would note in this is that uh, because we talked about the variety of what LSU can kind of be, um, the three-point line will become important here. We don't know, is LSU going to shoot it well? That They don't have guys that you know are consistent good shooters, but another thing that's concerned me throughout the Jerome Tang era is that there have been a lot of good looks for other teams from three, and so far this season um, in terms of what percentage of field goal attempts are being made up by three pointers for K state opponents. Uh, they're 37th in the country. Um, and that's like, uh, that's on the higher end there of almost 31% of their opponent shots are coming from three. That's a little concerning to me because that's a pretty good way to get yourself beat. E- even if you're maybe not necessarily playing a horrible game, uh, but you, you have less of a margin for error is if the other team is kind of knocking it in and, and think back to last year, This would be like Nebraska. Um, They didn't necessarily shoot it at the highest of levels in that game, but they got off 31 three-point attempts. They shot it about 36%, and it just felt like they were always hitting the big ones at the right time. I mean, freaking Rink Moss. Like, I I don't ever want to hear about that guy ever again. Um, That's not a fun thing to think about. So um, I I would keep that in mind, and I think that's something to, to kind of watch for in this game is can K-State do a better job of not even giving LSU the opportunity to bring that variety into this game and take those shots from the outside. Uh, Before we get into our predictions for the game and our our peak performers, first I want to remind everybody that the Wildcats are headed to Dublin, Ireland next August for the Aer Lingus College Football Classic. Join your Wildcats by booking your getaway at cats2ireland.com. The best seats and hotels will go fast, so secure your package now. That's Cats, the number two, Ireland.com. All right, Drew, uh, before you tell me K-State LSU prediction, uh, you got to give me a K-State women Creighton prediction tomorrow night. I assume you're taking the Cats to win. uh, By how much do the Cats win? Uh, I'll say that the K-State women win tomorrow by, I'll go seven points. That, That seems about right. All right, I'm again hater. Uh, K State women by 15. Uh, oh. They've they've proven to be down for the early season test in Bramlage in the the Jeff Mitty era. Uh, so I think that they are ready for it. Also, Creighton already has a loss this season uh, that they they suffered. Um, I think maybe just earlier this week. Um, so not not the best way. Or the, I guess that was last week they did, but they lost to South Dakota State which South Dakota State, fine team. Fun fact, I've seen the Jackrabbit women play <laughs> basketball before. Uh, a little NCAA tournament action down here uh, in in which, actually, I lie, that was South Dakota. So I apologize oh, to the Coyotes and the Jackrabbits. They probably don't like that. The, um, the, the there are a lot of them here. 
the the Jackrabbits women's team though it, it is traditionally pretty solid. So that that that's a tough game for Creighton well, to play. Yeah, and look, the Jackrabbit women, uh, they they don't shy away from a good schedule here. I'm looking at what they've got right now. So they already beat Creighton, who was number 21 when they won that game. They play Wisconsin tonight, and then they play Duke uh, later on this week. They play Duke on Sunday. Uh, they also have a game with number 25 Oregon on the schedule as well. So they uh, they really are not shying away from this. They also play uh, Dakota Wesleyan. So <laughs> I can only imagine that's probably one of those games where we're going to see the the post on social media later. That's like Dakota Wesleyan women scored three points against South Dakota State, who beat them 140 to three. And it's like, oh, why why are these D1 schools playing? NAIA Division Five teams. Like, can we not find anybody else? But uh, a lot of those small schools in, in Louisiana do that, as we know. Nichols and whoever else, they play a lot of those, like, church McNeese, camps. Especially. Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah, McNeese. Jeez. Will Wade, the slimiest <laughs> human being in college basketball, and he decides that he's going to schedule slimy, too. Uh, speaking of Will Wade, his former school, the, the job that got him blacklisted for a couple years, uh, how does LSU K State shake out tomorrow night? Uh, well, this is the third year in a row with K State playing LSU, as we talked about on the Sunday show. The first two games, very fascinating for different reasons. Uh, one was it was like the first test of the Jerome Tang era, uh, playing LSU in the uh, in the uh, tournament in the Cayman Islands on flow hoops. And then uh, last year was just, it was right after the, the Naquan Tomlin situation in case it just comes out and hammers LSU, which I don't think that anybody saw coming. Uh, and then this year, fascinating because Cam Carter is now playing at LSU and nobody really knows kind of what either team is at this point. Like we, we think that K-State's going to be pretty good. We don't really know where LSU is at right now. Uh, but because of that, I feel like you got to go with the home team and give K state, I think by, I think I said eight on a Sunday show, but I'll say, I'll say by nine tonight or today. Why not feel feeling one point better than I did on, on Monday. All right. Well, I don't know why I said on Monday, but I, I probably said K state by like 15 or something. That's kind of my go-to I'm taking <laughs> K state 82 LSU 69. I think the cats can score. Uh, it, it, there might be a little bit of diciness, I, but I think it could be bigger. And once again, K-State hasn't seemed to close out games very well under Jerome Tang unless it's, you know, in overtime or against Kentucky. Those seem to be the two uh, kind of holdups there. So I think K-State does it, uh, and I I do think that this is our first real welcome to the Coleman Hawkins show type game. Obviously, he's been good in other areas, um, but I think the offense has been a little sluggish. We talked about this with the Sunday show that he's gotten off to slow starts before, but once it gets turned on, it keeps going, and you don't really have to worry about it the rest of the year. Um, I think we get that started up tomorrow night against LSU. And, I mean, somebody, David Gasson or whoever, just just telling that Cam Carter used to play at K-State, and maybe he'll use his Coleman Hawkins fired up energy, whatever he he brings. His, the, the troll version of Coleman Hawkins shows up tomorrow night. Uh, and wants to inflict pain there for like the three teammates that Cam Carter still has playing for K State. So uh, that that would be uh, where I go with it. Uh, any other thoughts, K State LSU tomorrow night? Uh, I'll say, since you said that it's going to be a Coleman Hawkins game, I'll say that's going to be a Doug McDaniel game. Love it, love it. Great that, way to end it. Just, that just this purely based on vibes. I, I I got a lot of. I got better vibes about Doug McDaniel after the Jerome Tang press conference on Monday than I think I had really all season. Uh, just with Tang talk about how he can really see the light start to turn on for McDaniel and that playing point guard at K-State is hard because it is. And that he has really embraced the challenge and is starting to kind of not quite Marquise Noel level, but they're starting to see the game the same way. And I think that that's always a good sign. Well, I was going to say, is, is that one of the things that's going to make it hard to play point guard at K-State as long as Jerome Tang is here, is that the first year was the highest of highs. I mean, you had an all-American point guard that did Literally all the these different guard things. in the country. Yeah, like, 
Yeah, exactly. Yeah, very true. Uh, well, but yeah, he was the best in the country, but I kept getting told that he was the second best in the state. Yet, yeah, I don't know. Uh, the, the Dewan Harris love, he's fine, whatever. Uh, but he's not Marquise Noel. But like, I think that's going to be something that obviously the fan side of it will be there. But even for Jerome Tang, I think he's going to have to. I mean, he had to rewire himself in the middle of the season to get to where Marquise Noel was. And now I think he's going to have to kind of go back the other way and realize I may not ever have another Marquise Noel. So I got to take the qualities like that and just be able to, to live with everything else going on. I think it's, it's going to be interesting to see how that plays out, but I still go back to what David Gasson told us at media day, where he said that Doug McDaniel makes a lot of similar type plays to Marquise Noel and if Jerome Tang is coming out and saying, hey, he's kind of getting it now, it's clicking, then we're going to see something like that. And obviously, Tang is going to give his guard every opportunity to do that. He, It's not like he's a, hey, my way or the highway. He's shown that he can adjust to the team he has and the individuals he has. So I think it'll be uh, interesting to see if it starts to show on, on the court a little bit more with Doug McDaniel, which I think eventually it will. I'm not, I'm not worried about Doug McDaniel yet. No, I'm not either. And like I said on the Sunday show, I think that his passing has been really, really good. You would like him to be more efficient with, with a shot. But to be honest with you, Doug McDaniel has never been like a super efficient scorer. And neither was Marquise Noel. And it, it, it worked out well for him. Yeah, that's true. All right, that'll do it for us. We will have full post-game coverage tomorrow night at K-State Online and also right here on the YouTube. And a good reminder for everybody that if you're watching this on a Wednesday, tomorrow, game day, we will have a K-State recruiting update, talk a little bit of football and everything going on there, uh, and then we'll get on out of the way. We'll have a full Friday preview for K-State and Arizona State football and everything else that you could possibly want. So if you want the full KSO experience, you won't miss a single thing we do, go to On3, find kstateonline.com, become a member, and right there you're going to get all the written stuff, all the inside scoops, and also uh, every single link will be right there. So when we get a show done like this, boom, it's on the board. You can follow the link. You can watch it right there through the YouTube embed or however you want to get it. But going to On3, signing up at kstateonline.com, that's the best thing that you can do to stay locked in with the Cats all season long. So for Drew Galloway, I'm Mason Voth. We'll talk to you again tomorrow.